So in the fall of 2011, as part of a study that I'm conducting, I began collecting what's called the everyday theologies of LGBTQ or SSA-identified Mormons, their families, and their straight allies. What I want to do for this talk is present a small sample of the theme and content of my work for you. The purpose is to capture and represent sort of the multifarious ways in which uh, gay identifying, loosely spoken, um, Latter-day Saints understand God and how those beliefs are negotiated uh, by their circumstances and locations. So we know, of course, that uh, Mormon theology is, is itself is very unique. Um, for many of us who sort of identify as LGBTQ or so what, or allies and so forth, sort of the answer to the question of how we ourselves may fit within this framework, um, as one might expect, can be very alienating or elusive. It is perhaps one of the greatest privileges that the church extends to its members to sort of fit in or have a special place or valid place within what I consider to be a very restrictive concept of God. So in an attempt to better understand the nuances of our theology, there have been a handful of works, this is by no means exhaustive, but of works that have been done that have sort of to deconstruct or to help better explain, um, in, in more academic terms you might say, um, concepts of God. Um, but for, for this, this is sort of more the high, you might say sort of a high theology uh, attempt to sort of deconstruct from, 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 from primary sources and so forth. Um, but issues generally tend to be, uh, for Mormons it seems, not so much Paul or Leviticus, which generally tends to be for other Christians, right, what, where the concern is, but more what's sort of the eschatological nature of gender and sexuality, or in other words, sort of this ultimate trajectory of becoming like God as a heterosexually appearing married or single father or mother in heaven. The, also the idea of a presentation of a modern revelation or a revealed religion is absolute. So these things are more what we are grappling with, I think, theologically than our Christian brothers and sisters outside the church. When I was in my first graduate program in Connecticut, I can recall a rather formative experience at a certain family home evening, and I suppose that many of you may be able to relate to this. Most of everyone in my branch knew that I was gay and were very supportive. The director uh, of our institute even allowed me to teach an unofficial course in Biblical Greek. The, the warmth of their inclusion always comforted me and instilled something that I recall with fondness. But as, well, as is wont to happen, often in family home evening wards or branches of the church, the topic of discussion dealing with eternal marriage, which was of course linked to the concept of the heavenly father and mother, came, came up. The thought for me of taking a female eternal companion had been a great source of inspiration and motivation for me in the past, which kept me active in the church and demonstrated well my, my willingness to give the doctrine a good, well-intentioned try. But what came over me that evening was a rather weighty sense of sorrow, followed by the realization that I simply did not belong here. This, however, did not prevent me from continuing to, uh, in my involvement with this branch of the church and others that would follow. But I haven't forgotten the obvious fact that on the surface, most members of the church, whether contemplating these issues or not, really have little clue what to do with us theologically when all is said and done. So since then, I, I have set out hoping to make a contribution uh, to the LGBTQA movements in the church, imagining perhaps more healthy ways that we might work with our theology to include us, on, on, of those of us who are on the margins a little more fully. So uh, I first want to sort of talk about what I mean by everyday theologies, right? So this is a, a term that's coined by anthropologists of religion, and it has a sort of a specific, a specific meaning. So everyday theologies are those that emerge from sort of the day-to-day -day applications of what we read in scripture or other primary sources. So that would be for our, in our, our sake, uh, conference talks or things like this. They are generated in discussion with others and in the nuances of our everyday lives. And generated is an important word here. They become. They surface in the discussions. And often they, they're difficult to tie in to what we think we're all in agreement with, if you follow. There are, uh, there are in the questions, the, the, these everyday theologies are in the questions that we ask, the ways that we behave, the conclusions that we reach as we make decisions, and our performance of our lives and what sort of in-between Sundays, so between moments that we're actually talking about these things with each other. So here's an example. Jacob is an LDS 32-year-old man who is married to Sarah and lives in Bountiful, Utah. After 10 years of a more or less amiable marriage, Jacob begins to develop an unusually intimate relationship with Mike, who recently joined his task force at work. 
Over the course of the next few months, Jacob and Mike find that they are enjoying most of their free time with one another and activities that would appear to most Mormons as harmless. After some time passes, however, Jacob begins to feel that his affection for Mike is extraordinary. For a time, he quietly begins questioning the nature of their relationship and his sexuality and in general. One afternoon, while tossing through the scriptures and priesthood meeting, he comes across passages that articulate an intimacy which Jacob feels he can relate, described between Jesus and John in the New Testament, particularly as John is singled out as the one who was in some unique way, the one that Jesus loved. He begins to find his thoughts moving like this. If Jesus is the Son of God giving us an example of what we're supposed to be, how does this fit with my feelings for Mike? Are they the same? And if they are, what does this mean and what should I do? So uh, whether he realizes it or not, Jacob here is doing theology. Right? He's struggling to under apply his understanding of God in this text to the circumstances of his life. For my work over the last two years, I've been sort of collecting these everyday theologies from LGBTQ and SSA-oriented Mormons, their families and allies. I conducted a little over 100 hours of interviews with members of the church from the New York, Boston, Chicago, and Utah areas. I want to finish the, my talk here just to give you a sort of a sample of some of the things that, that came from those, those interviews. Now this, this is by no means finished. I'm still, I'm still doing this. This is most likely going to be my dissertation. So, I, so I, this is not exhaustive. There's, there's hundreds of hours more of interviews to be collected, which I'm looking forward to doing in the next few years. So um, some samples. If we can get this to work. Okay, we can't. So um, there's a, a, one woman that I interviewed wrote of her coming to an awareness of her sexuality through the promptings of the Spirit. I thought this is the most beautiful, elegant, one of the most beautiful, elegant testimonies I heard. When I was 12, she says, just out of primary, we were taught that when we say our prayers, to stay on our knees and see if we can receive an answer to our prayer. I don't remember what I was praying for, she says, but I decided to stay kneeling beside my bed I was just quiet and still, and I was feeling the Holy Ghost. In that moment, the awareness came to me that I was gay, and it was just really clear. I took that knowledge and shoved it to the deepest recesses of my body and soul because I knew that it was all bad and no good to be, Mormon, to be in, in the Mormon faith and to be gay. After doing a lot of scripture study in the past year, I have absolutely to agree that we are created gay, she says that it is not a mistake by Heavenly Father, and that he will honor homosexuals in the life hereafter." Unquote. In my response to the question to her about the nature of her decision to remain celibate, which I found surprising given this revelation, she said, right now it's time for me to be working in the church to live a celibate life, being the voice from the inside out. Um, it, is not, it is not a call, it is not in the act of being with someone that makes it bad or wrong, but a personal call, she says. I asked Heavenly Father if I'd be single for the rest of my life, and she says, he said no. He even told me what she would look like. I asked many of my interview subjects what they imagined their conditions would be in the next life, since Mormons don't really believe in this more widespread Christian notion of a hell, whereby homosexual behaviors, for lack of a better phrase, are understood mainly to be sort of a damning of eternal progression, rather than warranting a specific punishment. Responses to this particular question were surprisingly diverse, however. One respondent remarked that the homophobia of the church, including that which is apparent to him in actions and manners of the speech by general authorities, he said that needs to be fixed. He writes, or he says, there is no place with God uh, for anything but love. So you can't be there with any feelings of hatred or any other feelings for that sake, whether it's sexism or homophobia or hatred for your neighbor. That is what they'll be working on if they're not working on it in this life. When asked what it was like to attend church, as many of my respondents are actually still active, a large con consensus spoke of feeling loved and accepted by members, but outraged and betrayed by many of their actions, particularly around the issue of same-sex marriage. These interviews are very rich. I'm almost out of time. There, as I suggested earlier, there's much more that I could share with you, lots I could share with you. There's a great prolific, uh, prolif uh, whatever, here. For instance, as a rather enthusiastic discussion that ensued between some of my lesbian, gay, and bisexual friends here in Utah, other irrelevant theological concepts also emerged concerning the historical construction of gender and sexuality in the church and their relationship with the Mormon concept of eternal family and structure. Additionally, I also invited those interviews to offer Mormon-specific theologies that tended to grant them more of a sense of legitimacy in the church. 
Some noted that the, that the view of eternal progress was helpful, offering one particular respondent, quote, a sense of breathing space for him to develop in himself in a healthier, more organic way, recognizing that this may entail sort of any possibility for him. Another respondent shared a rather emotional experience of considering what it means to pray to Heavenly Mother as we examined our spiritual and theological implications of this in the church. 